thank you very much, and thank you to Andrea, Isabel, and Stefan for, for having me along. Um, so yes, I'd like to talk about our award-winning crowdsourced transcription initiative, Transcribe Bentham. We are recruiting the general public from around the world to help transcribe Bentham's enormous manuscript corpus. Um, Bentham was a philosopher and reformer born in 1748, and he died in 1832. I notice over there is uh, George Bentham, uh, Jeremy's nephew, who was one of uh, the editors of 19th century editors of Bentham's works, as well as being a very famous botanist. So it's nice to see him as well. So specifically what I'd like to talk about is why we launched the initiative, some of our results and the, the economics of crowdsourcing and then at the end I'll uh, introduce two tools which have been developed for the Transcriptorium project which Rory has mentioned. I'll fly, um, I'm going to try and do a live demonstration but I noticed the internet was crawling along earlier so it may not work but touch wood will be alright. So a, a key aim of Transcribe Bentham was to evaluate whether or not um, amateur volunteers were capable of carrying out complex tasks which are generally thought of as the preserve of trained researchers. Um, we've seen an ever-growing number of crowdsourcing initiatives, um, harnessing crowd participation to either create or improve online resources. Most crowdsourcing projects do, however, ask their volunteers to carry out relatively straightforward tasks, so identifying the shapes and colours of galaxies or correcting OCR text. Some, such as Old Weather or UCL's own Micropasts project, ask volunteers to transcribe things, but usually they're very um, organised and regimentalised records like museum index cards or ships' logs. Um, I think... Transcribe Bentham is perhaps the most demanding um, of its volunteers when it comes to crowdsourcing. Um, we ask them to do two tasks, one e either of which would be, would be challenging enough. Um, first, they have to transcribe 18th and 19th century handwritten manuscripts and then encode them in texting encoding initiative compliant XML, which is another um, task in and of itself. Since we launched to the public on the 8th of September 2010, however, the volunteers have more than risen to the challenge. Um, what you're seeing here are a few examples of um, manuscripts from the Bentham Collection, which, as you can see, are variously complicated by interlineations, deletions, marginal notes, uh, multiple authors, and, and more. And, and as well as that, they have to deal with Bentham's frequently awful handwriting, um, he, when he was writing in the early 1830s, just before his death, he was functionally blind. So these manuscripts are practically illegible, to me at least. You deal with Bentham's challenging ideas and his idio idiosyncratic style, such as his pretty general disregard for punctuation, which can make reading these things quite difficult. What all these manuscripts have in common, though, is that they have all been transcribed by amateur volunteers with a bit of quality control on our part, and that the transcriptions are to an extremely high standard. One volunteer even transcribed this abomination. Um, <laughs> I valued my eyesight too much to even try that one. But to briefly start with why Transcribe Bentham was needed. Um, Bentham is an important figure, perhaps best known for two things. First, his panoptic and prison scheme. Um, so this was a prison which Bentham envisaged of consisting of a central inspection tower with the cells arranged around the outside so the prison inspector could look into the cells at any point and see what the prisoners were up to, but the prisoners couldn't see the prison inspector, so they had to assume they were being watched at all times and thus modified their behaviour. And Bentham thought this central inspection principle was applicable to any institution requiring supervision, so factories, lunatic asylums, libraries, universities, even archives, dare I say it. Um, no panopticon was ever built, though, much to, to Bentham's crushing um, disappointment. The second thing that Bentham is most famous for is that he willed that his remains were to be publicly dissected by his friend, Dr. Thomas Southwood Smith, probably in the um, hope that others would follow his example and donate their own bodies to science, but also as another branch of Bentham's attack on organised religion, but that's a, another story. His remains were then, and I quote from Bentham's will, to be put together in such a manner as that the whole figure may be seated in a chair, usually occupied by me when living, in the attitude in which I am sitting when engaged in thought. 
So after 18 years of sitting in uh, Dr. Smith's living room, his non-paying house guest was brought to UCL, and it now the auto icon now sits in a cabinet um, in UCL's main building. Um, I had the, I've had the very dubious pleasure of having to carry the, the auto icon. Um, that was not in my job description when I applied for the job. I hasten to and then sit in a room on my own with it for 20 minutes to make sure nobody ran off with it. Um, don't really want to do that again. However, the, the panopticon and the auto icon tends to obscure Bentham's um, importance. His works have had a major historical impact and are still of major contemporary significance. He was the founder of the modern doctrine of utilitarianism, that is the right and proper end of all action and legislation, is the promotion of the greatest happiness. Bentham advocated female suffrage and wrote on topics as varied as juries, natural rights, punishment and reform, representative democracy, birth control, convict transportation, and he was a, an early proponent of sexual liberty. He's also responsible for coining words we use every day, so words like international, maximise, minimise, dynamic, these are all Benthamic neologisms. Um, researchers and students wanting to access Bentham's thoughts, however, face a substantial obstacle. The edition put together in the 19th century by his literary executor, John Bowring, is inadequate for modern scholarship. The, the Bowring edition omits works published in Bentham's lifetime, particularly those concerning religion and sexual morality. Uh, it doesn't include substantial unpublished works which exist in manuscript. And the edition also includes works compiled from Bentham's notes by editors, um, as well as edited translations into English of simplified French versions of works derived from Bentham's manuscripts put together by one of Bentham's disciples, the Geneva and Etienne Dumont. So there's a, a, a question on these texts as to how much is genuinely Bentham, how much is the translator, and how much is actually Dumont. Um, finally, the, the edition is very densely typeset, and it makes it a chore to use. And Bowring's biography of Bentham has been described by one scholar as one of the worst biographies in the English language. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of room for improvement. The Bentham Project um, at UCL was founded in 1958. It's a major scholarly editing enterprise. And it's producing the new collected works of Jeremy Bentham, uh, that's scholarly edition. Its aim is to create these works which accurately represent Bentham's writings as he envisaged them, um, based both upon his published works and the, the manuscripts. Um, this has seemed an almost Sisyphean task. Uh, Bentham's archive is vast, and to continue the tradition from yesterday of describing how enormous our manuscript collections are, um, this gives you a, an idea. The, um, the, number of, the estimated number of words that the UCL Bentham papers and the BL Bentham papers, the, the number of estimated words it contains is very conservative. Uh, it could well be even more than that. So 31 of a projected 80 volumes of the new edition have been published thus far, and about 40,000 of the 100,000 pages required have been transcribed. The majority of the Bentham papers therefore remain untranscribed, and their contents largely unknown apart from a, a vague outline index. And as a result, we only really have a partial understanding of Bentham's, um, the true extent of Bentham's thoughts, as well as its true historical and contemporary significance. And there remains a, a huge amount of work still to do, which is where Transcribe Bentham comes in, um, recruiting volunteers to help us transcribe these manuscripts via a specially designed web platform, the Transcription Desk, put together by the University of London Computer Centre. Um, excuse me, excuse me, some, some water. Um, the, the work done by the volunteers serves two main purposes. The first is that they'll be uploaded to a UCL library's digital repository and be freely available for searching by students, scholars, and anybody else interested in, in Bentham and his life. Secondly, it allows volunteers to contribute to humanities research rather than just consume it. Um, the draft transcripts produced by volunteers will act as a starting point for volumes of the collected works, and they are, they are being used at the moment for that purpose. And volunteers will be fully credited in any volume to which they contribute. Um, moreover, since many of these manuscripts have not been read since Bentham wrote them, there is a lot of scope for quite exciting new discoveries to be made. For instance, the volunteers have come across a, 
uh, unpublished, substantial unpublished section of Bentham's attack on the practice of transporting convicts to Australia. And they have also found a series of um, recipes which appeared to be destined for the Panoptican prison kitchen, which are, as I speak, being turned into a Bentham cookbook, um, which is a, another, another side project. So the heart of Transcribe Bentham is the transcription desk, customised media wiki, um, instantly recognisable to anybody who's used Wikipedia. So as well as transcribing the text, the volunteers also encode key features of the manuscripts in TEI. Um, we realise that volunteers may not have any experience of XML, let alone TEI, so a method was devised by which they could easily add the, the markup without necessarily having to understand all the minutiae. So the transcription toolbar at the top there, so the volunteer highlights a section of text or a place in the text, presses the button on the toolbar, and the tags are applied automatically. <clears throat> so transcribers indicate structural features of the manuscripts, such as paragraphs and page breaks and line breaks, compositional features such as underlinings, deletions and marginalia, and interpretational decisions such as unclear words or non-English text. And this is how the, the volunteer is presented with the transcription desk in practice. The manuscript image on one side, the transcription area on the other, and the, the transcription toolbar. A major change <coughs> in July 2013 was the introduction of this uh, preview tab. So now the volunteer can switch between the, um, the transcription area and their encoding and to see how their transcript will look when it's saved. Previously, the volunteer had to save their transcript and leave the transcription interface to see this. Um, and that could in, uh, lead to a loss of concentration and it's, it made it much more difficult to, to follow how the TEI actually works. Now they can see it and flick back and forward at will. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the main tasks in running Transcribe Bentham is the moderation of submitted transcripts and associated upkeep of the website. This slide illustrates the uh, transcription moderation workflow. So after a transcript is, is submitted, we check it for textual accuracy and to make sure that the encoding is consistent. Changes are made to the text and encoding if required, and the key um, factors here are when he, uh, whether any appreciable improvements could be made via further crowdsourcing. If we approve the transcript, it's locked to prevent anyone else from editing it. If it's not approved, so if there's masses of untranscribed words or the transcription is wrong or the encoding is, has not been done, we leave it open for somebody else to have a go at and, and improve. It's a subjective process, necessarily subjective, but it does ensure that saved transcripts are an accurate representation of the, the manuscript um, itself. And it also acts as a method for giving feedback to volunteers and an acknowledgement of the, of the work that they're doing. So some of our results, since we launched on the 8th of September 2010 and as of the 17th of April this year, volunteers have transcribed or partially transcribed 12,883 manuscripts, uh, an estimated 6 million words. Um, and of these transcripts, 92% have met our quality control standards. So the, the accuracy is extremely high. Over the lifetime of the project, volunteers have worked on an average of 54 transcripts per week. But as you can see, um, there's a particularly steep increase around about March last year. That's when we made the first batch of the British Library's Bentham Papers available. This is mainly family correspondence, so it's more immediately accessible in a way that the philosophical stuff um, isn't. Um, by any measure, volunteers are carrying out an enormous amount of work, particularly if you can, uh, sorry, I should say after, after that point, volunteers have worked on a, an average of 104 transcripts a week. So what they're doing is a, an enormous amount of work by any measure, particularly when you consider that a full-time researcher dedicated just to transcribing would be expected to produce 50 to 60 transcripts per week. So we've got the equivalent of almost two full-time members of staff going at this stuff um, in the background. Um, most crowdsourcing projects, including behemoths like Wikipedia, will find that most of the work has been done by a minority of users. So though we have uh, 485 people who've transcribed something, almost two-thirds have only worked on one manuscript, or one transcript rather, 
and then not done any more, which would suggest that they found the task too difficult or the task appeared to be too difficult for them to, to participate. We do have a small but growing band of what we call super transcribers. 26 individuals who have contributed about 95% of all the work for, for Transcribe Bentham. Uh, volunteers in blue are those who have participated in the last three months. Um, so as you can see, six volunteers have now transcribed over a thousand manuscripts each and one volunteer, uh, old old girl in the middle there, has almost, uh, is heading for her 2000th transcript, which is um, astonishing. All of which, all of this is astonishing. Um, super transcribers spend significant amount of time, significant amounts of time transcribing. They take a great deal of care and attention over their work. Um, and they care about the project a great deal, and there seems to be uh, an evident feeling of responsibility on their part of being entrusted with this material. And their submissions are highly accurate. These transcribers, when they submit something, it doesn't take very long to, to check their transcripts, and it's um, very little needs to be done to them. Though their work rate is prodigious, the fact remains that uh, the majority of people who register with Transcribentum don't do anything or very little for the project. So in that sense, Transcribe Bentham might not strictly be crowdsourcing in the sense that we don't have lots of people doing very small tasks over and over again. Um, Transcribe Bentham might be better termed crowd sifting, coin, a term coined by my colleague Melissa Terrace, in that we do the traditional open call associated with crowdsourcing, um, and then we support this sort of self-selecting smaller group of people who uh, have the time and the inclination and the skill to do this sort of work. Uh, this is just a sort of what, from our user surveys, what motivates transcribe and the volunteers. The um, mostly a uh, sort of a general interest in history and philosophy and Bentham himself. But the uh, particularly important finding is the altruistic um, motivations that people have. The, the fact that they also enjoy the task is important, but the, the fact that they're contributing to something greater um, and that other people are going to find useful. So we, uh, we recognize them in the form of a leaderboard on the front page of the website and they will be recognized in the, the, the edition as well. So as it's come up a number of times yesterday and today, um, major concerns about crowdsourced transcription, um, there are two that sort of interconnected concerns. Whether it's ultimately worth the effort and the expense, wouldn't the time and money um, invested in developing a platform and managing volunteers and checking the submissions, not be just be better off employing an expert to, to transcribe the stuff in the first place. So from the 1st of October 2012 to the 27th of June 2014, we measured the quality of uh, submitted transcripts in great detail uh, to an extent never before seen in a humanities crowdsourcing project. During this time, we approved 4,364 transcripts which was a collective transcription of around 1.6 million words, or an average of 371 words per transcript. During this period, we spent uh, just over 309 hours, or 41.2 working days, on checking transcripts. The quality of submissions was extraordinarily high. Um, it took us an average of just 3 minutes and 27 seconds to check a transcript and the average transcript required uh, only three alterations to the text and five to its markup before we accepted it. And we can break this figure down into the first iteration of the transcription desk and the second when the improvement work was done by ULCC. So you can see in the blue there is the first iteration, and red is the second, and far more transcripts were checked in under a minute uh, using the second iteration because there were far fewer encoding errors. These are the thing, the encoding errors were the things that really slowed us down when it came to checking um, transcripts. So connected to this um, increased efficiency is there is significant cost avoidance potential in crowdsourced transcription. When it comes to the Bentham project, if a senior research associate such as me was employed to transcribe the remaining 59,202 pages required to complete the full transcription of both the UCL and the BL Bentham papers, it would cost around 1.1 million pounds. And that includes on costs, so national insurance and superannuation. 
uh, and that assumes it would take an average of 45 minutes to transcribe a manuscript, which is a reasonably fair assumption, and that's an average cost of £18.35 per transcript. Thanks to improvements made to the transcription desk, um, as I mentioned, it now, it now takes an average of 2 minutes and 21 seconds of my time to check a transcript, um, and that works, a, a volunteer submitted transcript, I should say, which works out at around 97 pence of my time including on costs. If this task was carried out by an administrative assistant, then the, the cost per transcript check, of checking a transcript drops to 52 pence, uh, including on costs. And if the task was given to an hourly paid graduate student, it drops to about 44 pence for, to check a transcript. This does, of course, assume equal expertise across the three grades of staff, which um, may not be the case. The cost avoidance potential is particularly great in the case of a manuscript like this, a lengthy one, very complex one. Um, the checking of such a transcript may take far longer than average, but it's still much quicker than me sitting down and transcribing this thing from scratch. So this one, uh, owing to its length, its compl complex layout, the multiple deletions and marginalia, took me 32 minutes and 11 seconds to check. <coughs> and this works out at 13 pounds and 20 pence of my time. Uh, seven pounds and four pence for, admin for an administrative assistant, and five pounds and ninety-four pence for an hourly paid graduate student. Had I sat down and transcribed this page myself, it would um, maybe have taken me two hours to do. Um, so, assuming that it would cost one point one million pounds to employ me to transcribe everything. Um, the following potential costs could be avoided if all these remaining transcripts were produced by volunteers and then checked by the three grades of, uh, of staff. So over a, a million pounds in each instance could be uh, saved, or avoided rather. And this potential cost avoidance would more than make up for the investment made in Transcribe Bentham by both the AHRC and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And moreover, there would be ongoing cost avoidance. Um, when we produce a volume of the collected works, we build in time to identify all the relevant material and transcribe it. So having draft transcripts available at the beginning of producing a volume could save anywhere up to six months of a, an editor's time in producing um, such a volume. And it will help, hopefully help make um, for future editorial grant proposals more competitive. So. The key to success with crowdsourced transcription, from our point of view at least, is to present engaging, interesting material to volunteers via an intuitive interface, clearly explain and define why you are crowdsourcing, support your volunteers and recognise the value of what they do. And I, that's all easier said than done without the necessary resources, of course. And anyone considering crowdsourced transcription should be aware that it's not a, a quick and easy and cheap solution. It's perhaps only in the long term that the the investment will pay off. But the potential benefits do, we think, outweigh the risks. Uh, so in the case of the Bentham project, it's going to potentially be of en enormous benefit to, to what we do. Uh, assuming, and it's quite an assumption, that funding were available for transcription to continue uninterrupted at the rate it did before Transcribe Bentham, then the earliest point at which the rest of the Bentham papers would be fully transcribed would be 2081. Um, since Transcribe Bentham was launched on the 8th of September and up until the 17th of April this year, 8th of September 2010, and up until the 17th of April this year, um, volunteers worked on an average of 54 transcripts per week, or 2,808 per year, and at that pace the remaining untranscribed material would be transcribed by 2035, which is still quite a way off, but um, far faster than uh, and without in a world without transcribe Bentham. If, on the other hand, the volunteers keep transcribing at the rate that they are doing since the start of last year, then we could have everything transcribed by 2025. Um, if I had said to my boss that we would have the entire Bentham papers digitised, fully transcribed and digitally available in 10 years' time, he would have thought I was a lunatic. Um, so just to summarise... Hopefully, the work of Transcribe Bentham has shown that the potential benefits of crowdsourced transcription for large um, manuscript collections, at least, um, is feasible and the benefits are enormous. So recently, we've seen the Letters of 1916 project at Trinity College Dublin 
and the Edward Monk Museum in Oslo um, incorporate versions of the transcription desk in their transcription platforms. And the transcription desk code is available online for you to get hold of and customise to your purposes as you, as you see fit, should you wish. We're particularly proud of um, other people using the, the interface. Yes, so um, Transcom and Bentham would, we hope, have met with Bentham's approbation through the initiative's efforts to democratise access to, the creation of and access to uh, knowledge and humanities research, as well as its use of modern technology. Bentham loved technology. He is, his house in the 1820s had central heating um, and various other gadgets. Um, as Bentham wrote in 1783, many hands make light work, but many hands together make merry work. And transcribe Bentham continues to prove the truth of that particular maxim, we hope. And just to round off, as Rory was briefly mentioning, um, Transcriptorium uh, is an EU-funded collaborative project funded by the um, Seventh Framework Programme Scheme. Um, the team includes computer scientists, computational linguists, humanities scholars, uh, digital archive specialists, uh, Rory, and, and Rory and I as well, and, they, and, and humanity scholars, I should say. As well. And its aim is to produce tools and software which will help with the handwritten text recognition of digitised manuscripts. Um, it's got the potential to be truly transformative, and a couple of tools have been developed um, for the project, which I will try and do a live demo of. The first one is called Transcribus, um, developed by the University of Innsbruck. It's um, really a specialist tool for um, document management and um, transcription. It allows you to upload your own manuscripts to the Transcribus server and manage the ac who can access them um, apply document image analysis tools such as line segmentation, binarization, de-skewing, de-slanting, and various other uh, things to remove the, the noise and so on. Um, and eventually allow you to run HTR services on it. So let's see if I can find a manuscript. Hopefully this is going to work. Someone's already done the uh, line segmentation. So you can see that the software will automatically identify in blue the line area, and these purple lines are what are called baselines, so it's the bottom rung of each line. And apparently, this process is vital for the handwritten text recognition software to work. I'm not quite sure why, um, but it is. Um, this is an example of how detailed you can go, hopefully. You can, um, as well as line, going by the line level, ah, there we are. you can also um, go down to the word level, um, which, is, which could be useful for, for some projects. Ah, there we go, yep. So this one has been um, segmented down to line level. And you can transcribe in here, add various elements of the structure, so the paragraph, footers, and so on. Um, and we have virtual keyboards for different languages as well. So it, it's highly customizable and very useful. And one of the features is you can export these as PDFs. So you get this image, and it's a searchable PDF. So you can search within the, the image itself. Or you can export it as TEI or as a, a docu Word document. The other tool, as Rory showed, is TSX, which works on the same framework as Transcribus. So you're looking into the, the same material which you're managing via Transcribus, just from a different angle. And this is for most, mainly for if you want to start up a, a crowdsourced transcription project. So I'm hoping this will work. <coughs> That's looking promising. There we go. 
So yes, as Rory mentioned, you can either transcribe and add the TEI as you would in Transcribe Bentham, or if you are a new user or you don't have a lot of time, you can request a transcript from the HTR engine, which is a very unlikely to be correct. Um, as we can see here, this line isn't right. It's mistranscribed, informed. Were out of engaging is entirely wrong. It's by a captain who shot one. So, yes, <laughs> as Rory said, there are there are glitches in this, and this is quite a a neat handwriting. I think we're getting a word, what we call a word error rate of thirty percent in most of this sort of manuscript. So seventy percent of the transcript is correct. Um, the other feature is the interactive transcription. So again, if, imagine I can transcribe the first three words but then run into trouble. I press tab and I get a suggestion from the HTR engine of what the next word might be and it's informed so I select that. Or I can select an entire line at a time. Um, so we're hoping that will be particularly useful for people coming to the project new who might not necessarily have any experience of hand reading handwritten manuscripts or learning how to read a particular hand. At least if they come across a word they can't read, they can request some form of suggestion from the HTR engine. It might not be correct, but it might spark them into thinking, ah, it's actually that word. Um, so we'll hopefully be testing this with our super transcribers fairly, fairly shortly. And uh, I think I'll stop there because I've gone on long enough, but thank you very much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.